thank you so much for being here today. Um, I thank Father Colin, our, our uh, chaplain, for having that boldness, that uh, courageous fortitude, and speaking truth. It's very necessary in our times, because sometimes when you are bombarded with stuff over for years, you kind of become like, is it me? Or, you know, and, uh, you know, truth gets watered down. So it's good to hear, coming from the pulpit, that kind of truth. Those are the things that we are facing in these days. Um, I do want to mention that um, as far as the, the Dodgers go and whatever, the uh, media is saying that it was a sold-out game. So they're, they're saying... They're portraying a whole different story than what really happened. The game was, I guess, sold out. The problem is that <clears throat> there weren't many people at all inside the game. They, those that paid and then later found out what was going on did not attend. So there was a small fraction of people that were at that game. Most people were outside protesting. FYI. There's so much in my heart uh, that I want to share with you today. And for me, when the Holy Spirit puts on my heart um, his desire, the, the, the Lord's desire of what to talk about, it's not always easy, and the message sometimes is, is hard and it's difficult. However, great fruit is always born from it. So it gives, and especially after 30-something years of being in ministry, it's, it's given me that uh, boldness, that fortitude to, to preach what I need to preach. So that's what I'm going to do today. My best way, the clearest way, is to teach through different experiences, to share with you different experiences, testimonies, etc., because they're happening in our time. It's critical for us to know our church and the teachings of the church and the wonderful, amazing things that happened in the history of the church. Uh, it, was, it was critical to hear today what St. Paul went through. You know, he got beat up, he got stoned, you know, whatever, and he kept going. Who can do that but by the grace of God? And yet so many times today we go through stuff, you know? We get our butts kicked. We get persecuted. We get humiliated for our faith, our, you know, the, the good things we give ourselves to or whatever, or especially when we fall, right? When we fall, those fingers point at you. Oh, yeah, mm-hmm, you missed divine mercy. Uh, church lady, you pray the rosary all the time? Well, yeah, well, we're all human beings. All God asks is that we have the desire to do good, to be better, and that we try desire and that we keep trying to do better in our lifetime. And God gives us what we need to do that. So it's not like we have to have a lot of money to go shopping at the store to buy it. God will automatically give it to us because that's his will. He wants us to be heart to heart with him, to do our best. So I'm going to share a message with you. And I'm going to share a letter that I received recently. In fact, just yesterday with you from someone that uh, was part of this, is part of the ministry. And then I want to share a couple of real life experiences to bring it home to you. Okay, so please have, um, I pray, an open heart to hear that God anoints you for the listening, that he gives you light, that he speaks to your heart personally to accomplish healing. Because everything about the Shrine of Divine Mercy, every square inch of this property, everything is the heart of Jesus Christ for healing. This is his desire. Can you make a shrine? No. You can't make a shrine. Oh, no. 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 You know. I thought you were asking me to do some work. <laughs> oh. oh, that's later. <laughs> no, th this is something beyond any effort. I don't know who made I don't know. And, and, you know, maybe, anyway, we can't do anything so significant uh, but by the grace of God, right? Amen. All right, so let's, let's just, I'm going to just give you this tough message um, that the Lord 
gave me for these times, okay? And I believe with all of my heart and soul that this book, the messages that are in this book, giving years ago, were meant for our times now, and probably for all times. Jesus says, hear me, O Israel, my people. That's us. The way hunger pains cause the stomach to rumble and growl for the one who is starving, so should your soul emit deep groans of desire for the lamb who laid down his life for you. That's how deep he wants your heart to go. My heart suffers great pains of desire for unity in families, okay, for our times. There must be an end to the vain complacency that exists today. The lives of babies, children, and families are forming a river of blood, a total waste of my goodness. It is the most evil disease of our time. Jesus is lining it up. The most critical issue for our times is life. Because if we cannot respect life, there's nothing else that matters. Fear not the diseases of the body, for new ones you will receive. Have we not just come out of a pandemic? No, nah, we're still kind of doing whatever. Fear you should have, however, for the insidious black plague existing today, which devours in innocent lives. Amen. This black plague is devastating to the soul of mankind. The river of blood of the innocents continues to rise, and instead of great sorrow for many, there is indifference. How sorrowful is my heart for this atrocity. <coughs> I pray for courage for you, that you may stand as pillars of strength against this savage massacre. For those who do not, I have great pity. Anyone who destroys life that is mine alone to give and to take will never see the face of God and live. They will never walk with the one I love in heaven. They will never feel true joy. My judgment will be swift, but the punishment is forever. The righteous path of, path of life is not easy, but my light will lead you straight through the darkness. My abundant blessings on you, my chosen people. All right. The reason why I believe the Lord put that on my heart is so that we can re again, begin again today to pray for the insight in the depth that is necessary of understanding, and even if we don't understand, to begin to pray, especially as we go forward into the year ahead of us for the elections, okay? Do not believe what you see and you hear on TV or, or whatever, because you will fall. You will make the wrong judgment. Don't just do what you automatically have done for years or whatever from the past. What God is asking you to now to do is to pray and to listen. And if you have something in the gut that is not sitting well, you do not have peace, don't do it. Just don't do it. We really have to pray. There is so much on the line. We are in very serious times. Okay. Life, we know, is the most important. Throughout the many years in, in the history of this ministry, since I've been in this ministry, over 30-something years, there have been many people, many different situations that have come to the, first to the center and then to the shrine 
with their issues. I'm going to share this one with you today. Okay. Dear Catherine, I had mentioned, this was someone who had been out to the shrine recently. I had mentioned when I was out to the Divine Mercy Center that I had been writing you a letter for 10 years. 10 years. This is how long it took. So here it is in short form after much back and forth. And the only reason I'm typing is so that you can read it. Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> when I gave my very first talk about pro-life and my story and testimony, it was at the Divine Mercy Center, the old center. At that time, it was so very personal, well, so very personal, and all about my shame and sinfulness in having had three abortions in my past, as well as in an immoral life. It was through following the teachings and offerings at the Divine Mercy Center that I was able to forgive myself. And then beyond that, at one of my talks I gave to an all-men's retreat, the priest prefaced my talk with these very wise words. He said, every abortion story is a sad story. But what you need to do is to tell others what Jesus has done for you and how he transformed your life instead of, in, in, in spite of your sinfulness. That changed everything for me and I kept going back to the mercy and forgiveness I found at the center and through your talk in that first talk I gave there. Eventually, but not right away, I realized with great clarity that mercy and forgiveness does not need to be earned, but is there for the penitent with great love. Common denominator for every sinner and for every sin. We can't earn God's mercy. It's already in place waiting for us. Three abortions, an immoral life, etc., etc. And this isn't the first one. I have dealt with many people who have come to the shrine and walked through this horrible situation in their lives. Now I tell everyone how much Jesus loves me. And then in spite of my sin, that mercy and forgiveness is there for the asking. It's waiting. See, hard message, resolution. Jesus never leaves us hanging. Doesn't want us to feel like a black dot on your soul or something like that. Mercy's already there. You just have to take it. Ask for it. Once in a while, oh, does every day feel like that? No, but truly most days. Once in a while, that devil creeps in and triggers the remembrance of my sins. But then I turn to Jesus and his divine mercy. Thank you for being the beginning of my road to healing. Praying for you and all your works at the Divine Mercy Shrine. God bless her. Now I'm going to share with you my own personal experience uh, are there any children, little children in here? Mm. No. Right. Okay. Where? Nope. No. Okay. With a prostitute. Um, so, when I was 19 years old, I delivered my firstborn son. Uh, we wanted this baby very, very much. It was a boy. You know, an Italian family, that's a big deal. We all want daughters, but the first one, you know? The son. Carry the name, all that. He died during childbirth. And that was devastating for me. It was just, I mean, I was only 19. And I, you know, at 19, you're on top of the world. You own everything, right? Um, I had the nursery all set up. We had a great big shower for the baby Italian thing, you know, and whatever. Every, you, we wanted for nothing except the baby that we wouldn't bring home. I knew he was going to, I knew that was going to happen. Our lady revealed that to me. I told my mother and 
some of my aunts that were together at the shower that the baby wasn't going to be born alive. He died during childhood. Devastating, etc. Um, back then, I thought it was the worst thing in the world that could happen. For me, at that time, it was. And it took me quite some time to uh, process that morning. While I was in the hospital, at that time, I think there was three or four people in the room, three or four guys in, in the maternity ward, two of them. I had one, and there was a woman that was brought in through emergency um, a day after my delivery. She was a prostitute, and her baby was born alive at seven months gestation. I can see it in my eyes right now. I could see the veins through the baby's skin, but he was so precious, and her baby was moving and breathing and she cursed him. She called him every ugly name in the book that you could possibly imagine for being born, for ruining her body, etc., etc. I had the most beautiful roses all around my bed, red roses, that family members, parents, everybody gifted me. There's roses everywhere, there's red roses. I couldn't stand the look of red roses for a long time until Our Lady healed my heart and said her favorite color of flowers are pink in color and red, red roses. That helped me. I was so angry with this woman. God forgive me, I could have torn her head off. <laughs> God forgive me. And I prayed in that bed, listening to that horrible tongue and watching the ambulance taking this baby away to bring him to a neonatal you know, for babies that are in trouble. And <clears throat> at some point, I can't tell you when because I don't remember, but at some point, God touched my heart. And he gave me this sorrow, this compassion, this something. She started to swear again, and I sat up. I couldn't really move too much. I had a C-section. But I sat up and I turned towards her and I said to shut that filthy mouth. I can't hear those words. And she just, she looked at me and um, she explained, you know, she was angry and she didn't want this baby and so on and so forth. And after a little bit of time, and it was the Lord, because I, you know, I just wanted to, but after a little bit of time, the Lord put it on my heart, and I could finally move a little bit. And our beds were just like right here. I took some roses, because she had nothing. And I brought them to her. I handed them to her, and she looked at me, and she goes, you're giving me these? And I told her what had happened just the day before she came home, that my son was born dead, and that how it hurt me to hear her curse her son and so on and so forth. And those roses melted her heart. I don't know if she ever got roses before. She explained to me, you know, what a horrible thing that could happen to her at this time of her life. Can't figure out how it happened. Mm. Uh, but uh, that, you know, when she was a young girl, um, she was abused by her father who left sexually. Uh, her mother taught her how to turn a trick and then more, and then sold her too for her drugs, etc., etc. You got the picture. I don't have to go into any more detail. She went through all of that story. And I, I just, I didn't know what to feel worse about, the loss of my son or the loss of this poor woman's humanity. Humanity. Everything. Everything. She had nothing. She had no hope. She had nothing. And now this kid. So we had a long talk, and I, I prayed with her, etc. I don't know whatever happened to her. I know that she was impacted. I don't know anything more than that. I don't need to know. God knows. She's God's child. 
I did what God called me to do then, which was very opposite from what my flesh wanted to do. And that's what I'm trying to explain. It's really important that we don't do what we automatically do, say what we automatically say, whatever. We need to really pray in our times because our prayer is powerful. At that Dodgers game with the majority of people, the small fraction inside, yes, but the majority of people that were outside, it wasn't one time, it was noted, that Muslims and Jews and all the denominations, many de kinds of denominations came to protest with the Catholics because what was happening goes against our constitution and our right to worship and to have religion no matter what. No matter what the world is telling you today, we have every reason to be hopeful, to have great expected hope. But let me tell you something. It is a time, we are in those times, that every single person who loves God is going to have to stand tall, hold your ground, put on the armor of God, because you're not battling human beings. You're battling principalities. Every single one of this stuff that's going on right now can be traced right back to the devil himself. It is Satan. It's not people. People were created in the image and the likeness of God, and they're created beautiful and good. Every person. Satan hates that, right? So it's his job to do everything he can do to trip us up. His major arsenal is fear. When you are overcome with anxiety, depression, fear, whatever it is, immediately turn to the Lord. When you're faced with a situation that you think is no hope, I'm telling you, as sure as I'm standing here today, you have every reason to have hope. I sat with a lady back there a couple of days ago who came in here like a ball of nerves with her sister, who don't know why, she always wanted to come to the Shrine of Divine Mercy. There was one thing or another that got in the way, doctor's appointments, so on and so forth. She had cancer and um, she was convinced that there was no, you know, that there wasn't much time for her at all. And so, but on a fluke, her sister picked her up and they came together. And it just so happened, it was my day off. But I came in, there's no day off really in ministry. <laughs> I came in for whatever, just to have a little time to pray. And I saw her back there and immediately my heart was drawn to her. And so I went over to her and we talked and so on. And I said to her, do you know, not one of us knows for sure that we're going to get out of bed tomorrow morning. We're going to make it down to the intersection. None of us knows that. Nobody. God knows. It is God's plan. When I prayed over you, I saw light. That means it's not today. It means that you have plenty of time. So don't waste it. And really, that's a, a, an advice for all of us. No matter what is going on, life is precious. Don't waste it. Yes, I have seen many miraculous healings. I mean many, with my own eyes. And that's why I can stand here and talk to you this way and share these things with you. Because it's relevant, it's important, and it's meant for our time. And most importantly, this is what the Lord wants. Like I said, so many things of the past and we hear the scriptures, this brings it together for us. It should make sense to you. Many miraculous healings, but many different kinds of, of healings have I witnessed too. People that have come in, they only have three weeks to live. It's like, who's, who told you that? Don't ever believe these things. Don't listen to those things. Look at each day. God doesn't want you to look at the past. He doesn't want you to predict the future, or God forbid have other people predict the future. No. He wants you to live for today. He wants you to pray for today. He wants you to be the best, most honorable, the one with so much desire, because you are the salt of the world. You are the light wherever you're placed, wherever he has you. Yeah, like Father said, if you've got a grouchy husband, or a cantankerous wife, 
or kids that drive you nuts, whatever that is, give it to the Lord. Give it to God. Let him, let him help you take care of those things. Meantime, you walk this pilgrimage of life because that's what this is. It's a pilgrimage. It's a time, a short time <coughs> compared to eternity. Eternity is forever. Now, I want you to take a look at that crucifix. That's a pretty powerful crucifix. It comes from the old center. When we were doing a paint, when we had to repaint the chapel, the painter asked me if I wanted to, if I would let her clean it up. <coughs> Just paint that so it doesn't look so, so bloody. And I said, absolutely not. That's not even anything compared to what he went through. I learned while I was in Jerusalem that the average crucifixion took one week before death. They would hang for a week on their cross. It only took Jesus three hours. Think about that. Now let me tell you a little something else about that crucifix. The man who made, and it was a number, that made that crucifix was a street dude. He was a bad you-know-what. Can't say it in church. You shouldn't say it at all. He was bad. He was a rough guy. But he met and fell in love with a nurse. And she changed his life, unbeknownst to him. She got him to come to church and become Catholic, but he was just like Catholic in name only. Okay? One day, his brother told him, after many years, his brother was uh, a really faithful man, uh, a faithful Catholic. And he tried teaching him, he tried talking to him about God and so on. I was, yeah, 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 you know, whatever, that's good for you, that's good. Um, but never really moved him. Finally, his brother brought him a ticket. I think it was to Medjugorje. I'm not promoting or not saying anything one way or the other. But anyway, that was his story. He went to Medjugorje because he thought he was going on vacation. He never heard of Medjugorje before. <laughs> he thought his brother was paying for him to go on vacation with him. So he, he ate it up in a New York second. He went to Medjugorje and he looked around and then he started seeing all the stuff that was happening versions and the prayers and all that, whatever. And he was just like blown away. He was so deeply impacted and in that time he had a vision of Christ on the cross. Mm -hmm. The sins, etc. that he bore for him. And it changed him forever. That's a spiritual healing. That's a spiritual healing. Forever. That man came home, he heard about the shrine of the center of that kind of divine mercy and somebody, probably Ralph, I don't know. But anyway, came to the, the center and um, he brought this with him. He cut down this tree in his backyard. That's a real tree. Wow. Cut it down in his backyard. He bought a corpus, a corpus from Italy. He ordered it online and painted it to the best of his ability to look like what his vision and he said, there's a lot more, Catherine, but I said, this is good. Um, but this is what he saw, and he carried that with the greatest pride and love for what God had done to him. His life changed forever. He was such a teddy bear. Yes. You see that image of St. Anthony of Padua? There's a lot. That go, everything here at the shrine was given to us by God. I went on retreat to the Capuchin uh, have a retreat house in Washington, uh, Michigan. And St. Anthony was very dear to me because it was St. Anthony who, had, who introduced me to Divine Mercy. He was the one who told me in a, in a prophetic dream when he was teaching me about the Blessed Mother. That's in my book. you got to read that story. Anyway, so I always had this love because I always thought it was so stupid. I used to have this aunt who every time she lost her keys or her paper or something, she prayed to St. Anthony. I had no devotion necessarily to him. But I thought, oh, that's so stupid. Why would you bother some holy saint with your keys? I mean, come on. But I've learned a lot since that. But anyhow, St. Anthony, I, I went to the Capuchins, and when I came in, I saw him behind the desk on the floor. And I thought, oh, oh my God, if you only knew how holy this, how beautiful this saint is. And so... I remember asking the secretary, what's happening with that? Are you selling it? I'll buy it. Um, it is the closest image, because every time you see St. Anthony, an image, he's a fat old guy, and he's, he's not. 
He is handsome. He is, he is really beautiful. Uh, but anyhow, uh, and she said, no, somebody donated it. Um, yeah, maybe we'll see. And she talked to Father. Father said no. For 10 years, every time I went on retreat at the Capuchin, and I used to go more often, a lot more often, a few times a year. Every time I went there, I found him in the closet, on the floor, behind someone's desk, in some room, in a closet, etc. And so one year, it was Christmas. It was like two weeks before Christmas. And I had gone on retreat to spend a little bit of time for Advent. And as I was approaching the um, Capuchin retreat house, the Lord spoke to me and he said, the image of St. Anthony will be yours. It's my Christmas present to you. You see something? Jesus knows all about Christmas and Christmas presents too. And what kind of presents matter to him? Okay. And so I was just, I couldn't breathe. I was so excited. I mean, all those years. And the answer always came back, no. So I went on retreat, and I asked where the image was, whatever, and uh, it was it was in a closet somewhere or whatever. Anyway, I had a beautiful retreat. I forgot about the image. I forgot about it. I was on retreat. It was Advent. I just wanted to be with the Lord. I had a lot of things in my heart. I was, you know, checked out when my time was up. Checked out. I was walking in the parking lot to the car, and as my hand touched the handle, a voice from the office called Catherine. Catherine, hold on a minute. Come back in. And so I, re I turned around and I thought, oh, did I forget to pay something? Or I don't know. Mm -hmm. I went back in and um, the rector back then came out and said, Mrs. Lonnie, it's come to my attention that you have been asking for this image of St. Anthony for so many years. He took it and he handed it to me and he said, Merry Christmas. Oh. Oh. But that's not... That's not the story. That counts. I was so excited. I couldn't wait to bring this to our prayer group to, to share. That, that particular night was the night I had to be back for prayer group. Uh, we were at St. Barnabas at that time. That night, I had it covered. And I was so excited, I couldn't wait. I told everybody, I have such a special surprise for you. You're not going to believe this. I uncovered it. And a woman began to weep like crazy, just like her breath, just this gasp and, and cry and whatever. So afterwards, she came up to me and she said, I was ready to leave the church. Uh, something happened to her, whatever, in the church, whatever. And, and she said, and I came, I heard about this, and I came here tonight, and I was imploring St. Anthony because I felt lost. I implore him to help me, to, to lead me to the right place. Um, because I, I was going to leave the church. I want to leave the church. She said, and when you unveiled it, and it was St. Anthony, I knew that I knew that God wanted me to be in this place. I'm going to join this church. I don't know who he is. I don't know who the pastor is. I don't know anything here. I'm joining this parish because this is where St. Anthony's picture, this image came. You see? You see how beautiful, how simple, how God does things? What did I know about that? I just wanted the image. <laughs> I waited so long. I couldn't wait to bring it home. But the, God, but the Lord God gave it to me with one request. That one day, when the divine mercy, this place, became a reality, that I would no longer keep it in my home, or myself, and my family, whatever, that it must be here at this shrine, at this place of divine mercy for everybody to enjoy. And I'm telling you, as sure as I'm standing here, I have nothing, but I have everything in the world that I could possibly need. I have Jesus. You have Jesus. It doesn't matter what your problem is. If you're afraid to die, if you're afraid because of sickness, if you're afraid because you're alone, if you're afraid for whatever you're afraid for, let me tell you something. You have nothing to fear. Wear a crucifix. I always choose, and all our prayer ministers have the St. Benedict's. Have a scapula. Pray the rosary every day in the chaplet. That's it, folks. 
It's not difficult. It really isn't. The road, the path, walking through life and always doing the right thing, speaking the truth about things, standing for the faith and for our church, no matter what, remember, the battle has already been won. The devil will make you think that it's over. It ain't over. It is not over. God is in control. He's on his throne. He has never left. He will never leave. And he's waiting for every one of us. Yet, I have spent some difficult times in ministry. Got my butt kicked quite a bit. But by the grace of God, kept standing up and pursuing. Just continuing to persevere. And that's what God calls all of us to do. But in that process, I've helped many people, this ministry, our prayer ministers, have helped many people to make the transition from this life to that life. And I can tell you, with all blessed assurance, my eyes have seen God. I have seen Jesus Christ in person. Our Lady has touched me. Literally, she has touched me. I was healed through her intercession. You will hear me say this for the rest of my life because I want you to know that God is alive and he is with you. And sometimes we just think that he's too important or too far away or we're not getting what we want. I'm telling you, if you're not getting what you want, God is working on something. Give him that time to work in your heart. Give him that time to work in the family. We just have to know that he knows what is the best for us. When I was on my face and all I could see were his feet, heard me say it. I could stay there all the rest of my life. When I knew that my death was impending, I knew that I knew I was done. Our lady was standing next to me. I could tell you she gave me the peace. I was praying for healing that I could raise my children, and I didn't even have a chance to hold my newborn. But I knew that if it was not God's will, I would be perfectly happy. The fear was gone. Somehow it, I had peace in my heart through her intercession that somebody would take care of the kids and my husband, whatever the case. All I wanted was to be with her. And finally, when Jesus appeared to me, revealing to me all the things that he did, all the things that were yet to come down the, the pike, so to speak, I couldn't bear for him to leave. That's what it feels like. You just want to be there. You just want to be with him. We don't have that pain and all that stuff that we feel here on earth. We just want to, that's the destiny. And when I said to him, because something in me, not the knowledge, the spirit, knew when he was leaving, after he, when he appeared to me, I said to him, Jesus, would you bless me? He was already half turned. He turned back at me and he had the most beautiful smile on his face and he touched his heart. And he blessed me. I did not know back then that was divine mercy. Right? Until some time after that. Thanks be to God for his intercession. Same thing as intercession. So I just want to share these things with you. I need for you to carry them in your heart. That no matter where you're at, be a person of righteousness. To the very best of your ability. And when you fall, know that mercy is waiting for you. To get back up and to keep going at it. You are the light in this world. Bring that light wherever you go. Okay? Now, finally, you said you had some work to do. No. <laughs> I want to, I just want, as a normal, regular person like yourself, okay? We, we don't have, we're not a church, right? This is what happens after church over here. This is the heart of Jesus. He wants this for healing, and that's what happens. Many different things. When we ask, we have our events coming up, things, whatever, the sister's asking for bourbon. Okay, it's not because they're, they're doing bad things. No, it's because we need it for the event. Okay? So put it out there. So maybe, maybe you can come and, and buy a ticket or two to come to the event. It's our biggest event that supports our ministry. We don't have what the church has. Like every week you get money from the you know, people and all that stuff, however that works. We don't get anything from the archdiocese. We receive from whatever people have in their hearts to give when they feel like it. 
And that's good. That's good. I'm good with it. God has helped us do it. So when we ask you for a bottle of bourbon, or for wine, or for a ticket to the event, or a donation or something, don't get mad. Don't get upset. We're just, we throw, will you do it? If you could get the ticket, if you can come and support or, or donate to it, fabulous. If you can't afford something, don't worry about it. You only can do what you can do, but every little bit helps. So I, we have at our event coming up at the Mission of Mercy, our biggest event, it's an evening in Paris. It's going to be phenomenal. Oh, it's going to be really great. We have a beautiful opera singer and a quartet. And we even have the Eiffel Tower. <laughs> Um, part of the thing that we're doing is to have these locks of love, right? Is that what it's called? Love, love locks. Because that's what they have in France. I guess there's this big fence and they have books on it, you know, and you have locks and you put special, I don't know. I, mean, I haven't been there. But I'm going, I'm going to be there on August 18th at the Mirage where I go. We'll be in France. So we have these printed out. And what we want to do is have, if you can, they're $25 donation. You put a... Um, you could do this for someone you love or a special memory in memorial of somebody or something like this, whatever it is. Right, Maria, am I saying it right? Yeah. So, and, and um, we're going to have them on display, your message on display at the Mission of Mercy. Friends, you just do what you can do. God takes care of everything. We've been blessed. You know, there's been... Times where we couldn't even afford the, the electric bill, and we should put it on the altar. And by the 11th hour and the 59th second, the money came through, and there was no problem. Thank God, we're not in that position. We're by God's grace, we're being we're able to uh, maintain and keep going, and we're doing well. Uh, but anyway, get a bottle of bourbon and bring it in, a bottle of wine, get a ticket for the Mission of Mercy, or whatever you want to do. Put a love name on there, however that works. This is your ministry. I'm the mouthpiece. My job is to keep pushing forward, and I'll do whatever God wants me to do. It doesn't feel good to bad. But you know what? I do it for the Lord. And let me tell you something. Our volunteers, I see, just like you saw John go turn you know, the light on the crucifix. Somebody forgot to turn it on. Another person will pick up a Kleenex off of the floor. Somebody else is cleaning up something else. You know, toilet overflows take care of it. It's from the heart of the people because this is their father's house. This is our father's house. So please, please, please pray about helping us out because I want to do everything, everything we do to press forward and to make happen what God's plan is for this place. More sisters to come, more vocations, to do the things that we need to do here. And the bottom line is it's for healing. Okay? Just do what you can do. And if you can't, don't worry about it. It'll come another time. Okay? I thank you. I ask God to bless all of us. I'm sorry for the lengthy talk tonight, but today, but the Lord just put this on my heart. So it's your fault. God. <laughs> but anyway, thank you for taking the time to listen to it. I just, I pray that you heard the message, that it spoke to your heart, and that you know God is alive in your life too. He's working. He's doing stuff. So have confidence. God bless you. God bless your families. God bless all of our families. And bring healing wherever we need healing. Thank you so much. I appreciate you being here today, too. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I thank appreciate you. your message. Thank you. Praise God. We're going to have, if you would.